Welcome to the Women in Data Science, also known as WIDS at Lane Medical Library. I'm so glad you can join us virtually today. This year marks the third annual WIDS at Lane conference, and I'm joined with my colleagues, Amanda and Connie from the research and instruction team at Lane. To begin the conference, we would like to acknowledge the land on which Lang is built. Lang Medical Library is situated in Palo Alto within Santa Clara County. However, these are fairly recent political boundaries. The entire Bay Area and the surrounding Northern California region has played an integral role in the lives of Native people for thousands of years. It has been the ancestral home to the Miwok, Pomo, Weipo, Ohlone, Patwin, and many other Native people with their own long histories of movement and interaction. In addition, the Spanish colonial missions and the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs forced many thousands of other Native people from outside the Bay Area to relocate here. Their descendants have remained for generations. As a result, the Bay Area has long been a rich and complex site for Native life. As a medical library, we recognize the substantial traditions and innovations in medical library practice that has existed in native communities across the Americas, including indigenous technologies for pain management, reproductive health, and other forms of care, as well as the ongoing role of the Stanford American Indigenous Medical Students Organization here at Stanford Medicine. With that, I would like to introduce Colleen Cuddy, Director of Research and Academic Collaboration to welcome you to our conference. Thank you, Lily. And thanks for reading our land acknowledgement statement. That's a new statement that Lane Library has put together. And I want to thank Drew Bourne, who is the curator of the Medical History Center for his hard work on that. It's no small task given the complexity of indigenous peoples in the Bay Area. I also want to extend a warm welcome to our attendees and speakers today. This is the third year that Lane has held a Women in Data Science event, and it's been a pleasure to watch the event grow and thrive over the years. We've had several women speak over those years, and this year's speakers joined an illustrious group of experts. Our first event focused on women in information science, speaking to how they forge careers in data science. Last year's theme, Fearless by Design, Imagine, Innovate, Impact, picked up on the education thread as our speakers explored how the field of data science has transformed and spoke to challenges that remain for women. It was a multidisciplinary panel that furthered our understanding of women navigating data careers. This year, the main Women in Data Science event was truly international. It was actually held on March 8th, International Women's Day. The event harnessed virtual conference technology to draw participants from around the globe. And we've modestly done the same as we offer Lane's Women in Data Science conference virtually for the first time. When I last looked this morning, we had 84 people registered, much more than we could do um, limiting to our in-person space, I think we were able to have about 30 people. Last year, for people that were here, maybe remember that we held our conference in person on March 2nd, and it had limited seats available. The date, as you're well aware, was just before Lane shut down as the world was grappling with the coronavirus. The theme of this year's conference, Focus on Clinical Data, is more important than ever. The world pandemic has thrust clinical data into the spotlight, highlighting ethical uses of data. It has also highlighted health disparities in the United States for Black Americans, Indigenous peoples, and people of color. And we are currently seeing the impact of COVID as it rages in the global South. We yet are also seeing the social impact of COVID especially on women as they struggle more than ever with the burden of managing and balancing or just trying to manage work and home. I've been thinking about this event and, and, and the relationship to clinical data. And I, about 15 years ago, I was working at NYU School of Medicine. The library became involved in what I thought at the time was a very pretty novel data project, working with a group from the city and Bellevue Hospital 
that use data from the 1918 flu pandemic to model how a new pandemic might impact New York City. And this was done in order to suggest responses as when the government might consider shutting down schools and public transportation. And I often wonder if those models were used last year. And this spring, the library has been involved in discussions with the main campus library on the feasibility of hosting the Atlantic's data tracking project with its COVID statistics and associated metadata. The data that we are collecting today needs to be as open as possible, shareable for researchers today and for future generations. How we leverage clinical data to inform evidence-based medicine, public policy, mental health, and our community and social structures is essential. And this is going to require an interdisciplinary approach that emphasizes fair and ethical use of clinical data. And I am the first to admit that open access to data is not without its challenges. I think if you just say the word PHI, doors start shutting and avenues start closing, um, it raises a lot of fear. And I don't necessarily think that has to be so. I think those are things that we need to work through. And we have the expertise, I think, in this room and, and um, throughout our global um, partnerships. Lane Library is also engaged with the community and working with individual researchers to make their data more accessible. And we've been doing um, contracting for data science hours. You can drop in for that on Wednesday afternoons. We have classes um, that help people figure a lot of this out. And we've also curated with Dryad as a repository for people to um, researchers at Stanford to make their data publicly available. Um, in closing, I look forward to hearing our speakers today and learning about their research and, and then to a lively discussion on how we can make data more ethical and accessible. I wish we were all there together to share her coffee and chat during the break um, and after the conference ends. And I encourage everyone to keep the conversation going through our multiple ch virtual channels that we're so used to employing these days. Lastly, I just want to again thank Lily Wren, Amanda Woodward, and Connie Wong for organizing today's event. Thank you, and let's get started. ...of our conference today, which is the lightning talks and panel discussion. As Colleen mentioned earlier, the theme for this year's panel is clinical data. In medicine, clinical data represent one of the most central and transformative resources to healthcare progress and knowledge production. Clinical data consists of information ranging from records to health status and determinants of health to documentation of care delivery that are captured for a variety of purposes and stored in numerous databases and repositories. Advancements in interoperative electronic and personal health data repositories, analytics, and the development of approaches to link and network these data offer great opportunities to create, use, and reuse rich data resources to help transform the healthcare system delivery and outcome. Today's panel features four outstanding women from Stanford who will be speaking on their innovative projects and unique experiences related to data science and clinical data. This will be followed by a panel discussion and question and answer. So if you do have questions for the speakers uh, or about general data science, please feel free to just type them in the chat when we get to that point. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Anna Key, Jackie, Rita, and Bonnie. Dr. Anna Key Claypool is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital and Harvard Medicine. She earned her PhD in Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University this year, and her BA in Mathematics and International Affairs from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Anna Key's research is focused on developing models to evaluate health policies, impacts, and costs. Her dissertation research included analyzing the cost effectiveness of dengue and chik chikungunya virus prevention with a dynamic transmission model and developing methods to help improve modeling multiple diseases. She'll be speaking about her SC Cosmo modeling consortium project, which looks at COVID-19 deaths, cases, deaths, and hospitalizations for each county in California. Next, we have Dr. 
Jackie or Jacqueline Ferguson, uh, who is a research fellow in the Big Data Scientist Training Enhancement Program at the Palo Alto Veterans of Health Administration. She specializes in using secondary data sources such as occupational records, insurance claims, and electronic health records to study the relationship between environmental, social exposures, and population health. Her research interests are widespread, but all center around methodology to handle time-bearing exposures affected by prior exposure and methodology to account for multiple co-exposures or exposure mixtures. Jacqueline's current research focuses on applying meth methodology primarily developed for assessing chemical mixtures, environmental epidemiology to examine co-occurring social determinants of health. Her research seeks to understand how multiple social determinants of health can simultaneously influence veteran health and virtual health care access at VA. And she'll be speaking about her project at Veteran Affairs related to telemedicine expansion and access to disparities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Third, we have Dr. Rita Pope, uh, who is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health and director of the master's program in clinical research and epidemiology at Stanford. She has a PhD in epidemiology and also holds master's degrees in biostats and physical therapy. She teaches several research methodology and data analysis courses. Teaching and mentor continue to be the source of, of joy in her life. And um, for today, she'll be sharing her uh, experiences with clinical data and opportunities for maximizing the potential of data science. And lastly, we have Dr. Hani Bonnie Hopper Fesher, who is a 10 year professor in the Division of Adolescent Medicine Department of Pediatrics and the Taub Endowed Research Faculty Scholar. She also holds courtesy appointments in epidemiology and population health professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. She's also the founder and executive director of the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit and the Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit. Dr. Helper Fesher is a developmental psychologist with additional training in adolescent and young adult health funded by the NIH and many foundations. Her research has focused on understanding and reducing adolescent tobacco use, alcohol and marijuana use, and risky sexual behavior. Her research, including over 170 publications, committee work, and advocacy work, have been instrumental in setting policy at the local, state, and national level. She has served as a consultant to a number of community-based adolescent health promotion programs and has been an active member on several national campaigns to understand and reduce adolescent tobacco, e-cigarette, alcohol, and marijuana use. She has testified in several cities, states, uh, in Congress, and at the FDA arguing for more tobacco and e-cigarette regulation. She has also served on six Institute of Medicine and National Academies of Medicine committees, contributed to three Surgeon General reports, all focused on reducing adolescent risk behavior and promoting health. And today she'll be uh, talking about her project on emerging tobacco products. With that said, I will hand it over to um, Anaki to uh, start uh, to uh, talk about her project. Thank you very much, Lily. Uh... I will just try sharing my screen. In one second. All right, are you able to see it? <laughs> Great. Um, so today I really wanted to talk quickly about a project um, that was looking at projecting COVID-19 outcomes in California counties. And this is work I did with uh, Jeremy Goldhaber Fieber in health policy. And I, the reason I wanted to talk about this one today is it uses some clinical data, but it also uses data that's um, being collected as we went along. Um, and, and sometimes there were delays in that data, sometimes we didn't have full data, so it was an interesting project to try to um, come up with helpful um, modeling outcomes when we didn't have all the information yet. And um, this is done with SC Cosmo. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team involving uh, Stanford and C-Day researchers, and C-Day is in Mexico, and Agos Calientes. Um, and what was great about this team is we were able to work together to create a, a pretty complex model and then and use this model with many different contexts. Um, and 
uh, one of those contexts is in California. So this, uh, these are numbers I took yesterday um, from the NPR website. And you can see that even though um, the new cases per day have gotten much better in California um, recently, that it's still um, the top in the United States for number of cases and number of deaths. Um, and so in this project, we had been working, um, looking at different counties in California since um, April, March or April of last year um, and developing this SC Cosmo model for California. A little bit into the model structure, and this is a lot to take in, um, but the main uh, model structure is a SEIR model. I don't know if you've heard of it in the context of COVID, but S is basically saying like a susceptible state for people. E is exposed, I um, is infected, and R is recovered. Um, and this sort of model is used a lot um, in epidemiology um, to try to get some of the transmission parameters that are happening um, within within the, um, the, the outbreak um, while still trying to model and project future outcomes. Um, we had multiple exposed and infectious compartments to allow for non-exponential distributed dwell times. And so you can see that those were all the exposed and those were all the infected compartments. Uh, the model also tracks illness severity, um, which is related to outcomes, but also likelihood of diagnosis. Um, so here we had um, severe, severity one, um, which you can see here, um, as opposed to severity two. And so that accounted for differences in diagnosing it, which is up here um, and down there. This is especially important when there was, uh, were fewer tests and there was less screening that was done regularly during COVID. Um, the model is also age stratified, um, and so we look at different ages of groups and how they mix with each other. Um, and in addition, we have a household model and an out of household model to kind of um, differentiate mixing between households and exposure there versus um, outside of the household um, when somebody might be working um, or, or they're in the household for any reason. And that was especially important during the, the shelter in place. And so then how we did it to calibrate to county incidents. Um, we looked at first at social distancing factors and change points because social distancing changed quite a bit um, over the past year. And then we calibrated it um, to the incident series. So how many incident cases there were um, every day. Um, and then we calibrated the, um, the hospital prevalence or we calibrated hospitalizations and death rate to hospital prevalence and deaths. And we repeated this calibration process every two to three weeks um, over almost a year. <laughs> um, so first the social distancing and change points. Um, we use public mobility trend data to inform social distancing factor. And this is shows an example in Santa Clara County. Um, so you can see that, oops, um, that during the, uh, here's the NPI start, so the start of the lockdown or non-pharmaceutical interventions, and you can see there was a marked decrease in going to workplaces and transit, um, grocery um, and pharmacy, then it, gradually there's an increase in parks, and you see that same decrease in that. So we use that to kind of um, to inform our social distancing factor over time and see where the change points were when this increased over time versus it stayed kind of flat and lower. And then using this difference in social distancing, um, we calibrated to the incidence of each one of the counties of California. Um, and we used an elder me directed search. And so we tried to, to minimize the goodness of the error um, from the target data, which we see in the last slide, um, to what our model is producing. Um, we ran 600 runs for each of the 34 counties or we grouped counties that were smaller. We did this on Amazon Web Services um, and we had 40 parameter sets with the best fit. Um, so these are the 40 that were the closest to what we, we saw in the instance numbers and we use those for probabilistic projections. And then um, we used our model calibration um, with incidents cases, we estimated the arrivals for hospitalization, um, how many people were in the hospital and how many people would leave the hospital um, in order to project our hospitalizations. And for we calibrated it also to COVID-19 deaths. So we looked at the case fatality rate um, and how it was changing over the epidemic um, as more data was becoming available. And 
and more um, and different treatments were available, different hospital capacities. And then from the best fitting parameter sets, we calibrate this to incidence cases, we calibrate a monthly case fatality rate. Uh, and then from there, we're able to aggregate up to the statewide level um, for cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and uh, estimating that are effective, both county and statewide. Um, and so these we all, um, we included in the CalCAT website, which is part of the um, Department of uh, Public Health in California. Um, and you can see here an example. And so um, this is a recent, or this is not a recent one, but it's until October. And you see it's all part of an ensemble model. So here in the blue line, we have ensemble model. This all shows the R effective. And so um, over one is uh, widespread community spread. Um, and then under one is um, it's likely stable. And you can see here is that our Stanford model listed there um, compared with the ensemble model, which is kind of taking a, a weighted average of all of the different models that are being incorporated into their modeling tool, which is nice because it gives kind of the wisdom of the crowd. Um, and here is with hospitalization prevalence um, and projecting out the hospitalization prevalence over a certain amount of time. And you can see the difference from the current daily hospitalizations from when I took this um, to the Stanford projected total. Um, so pretty close. And that's about um, all I have, but uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'd be happy to also answer any in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Anaki. Uh, we will move on to Jackie, uh, who will be presenting about her project. Great, thanks so much, Amy. So uh, my name is Jackie Ferguson, and I'll be talking today about a bit of work that I've been doing with the VA, looking at how telemedicine has expanded and how that has possibly caused some access disparities uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but before I begin, I actually wanted to talk about the unique opportunity that has um, that caused all of this wonderful research to happen. Um, I'm a postdoc in what's called the Big Data Scientist Training Enhancement Program, which is a program between the VA and academic institutions across the U.S., where essentially what you do is you take someone who's really interested in learning something more about data science or epidemiology, and you match them with VA data and academic staff and research support that can help um, support them um, as mentors. And so I'm paired with the Palo Alto VA and Stanford, and it is only for postdocs, um, but if you're looking at um, opportunities to get excellent, excellent data mentorship and expand your idea of what a data scientist is, I recommend you do this. Um, and so I started this program about two years ago in December and got appointed just about the time when uh, COVID began uh, hitting. And very quickly, we realized that virtual care really needed to be expanded in order to accommodate the sheltering in place orders and still provide care to veterans. And in doing so, the VA really made a dramatic and unprecedented shift um, and expanded its virtual care um, across multiple clinical spe specialties to bridge the gap between veterans, VA, and its providers. And this virtual care was really critical for maintaining healthcare access um, when inpatient care was disrupted, but we're concerned that a rapid transition could actually exacerbate disparities known as the digital divide, whereas veterans who are dependent on only in-person care could suddenly find themselves unable to access VA healthcare services. So to kind of assess whether or not that was happening, the first thing we did was we looked at over 42 million outpatient encounters that occurred within the first um, six months of 2020, and we categorized those encounters by type of care, whether they were primary care, mental health, um, specialty care, or other, and then we also categorized those encounters by their delivery care methods, so whether they occurred in person or by video or by phone, and we plotted those graphically. So what you're seeing here on the left is um, the total number of outpatient encounters that occurred in the VA between January 11th and September 5th um, in 2020. 
And this gray line here represents the total number of encounters, which as you can see, dropped off pretty dramatically following March 11th when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. You also see the in-person here in kind of the brown gold dropped off and a corresponding increase with phone visits and also video visits over that time period. Um, so between March and April, the VA encounters reduced nearly threefold from an average of about 2 million to six, uh, 600,000. At the same time, there was a 2.6 fold increase in phone visits. And while you can't quite see it as clearly on this graph, video visits actually rose pretty dramatically. They were around 10,000 per week, um, so over 60,000 uh, in April. And then by May 2020, VA was averaging over 100,000 video visit encounters a week, which was a, a, over an 11-fold increase. And we can look at the differences um, by specialty care type. So we can see that mental health providers, mental health care had a larger increase in video visits, and that primary care really did a complete switch between phone visits and in-person visits. We can look at specialty care, diagnostic, and rehab care and see corresponding shifts and how those specialties also change. For example, while specialty and diagnostic care had large relative increase in the number of phone and video cares, the absolute number of encounters remained pretty low. And that's possibly due to multiple factors, including low baseline use of virtual care and the intentional postponement of elective procedures early in the pandemic. Um, and then for rehab care, what we found was quite interesting was there was actually a 17-fold increase in video-based encounters, which was the, actually the largest relative increase in video care among all the services at VA. But even though virtual care has been critical for maintaining healthcare access, um, perceived benefits could be reducing exposure amongst patients, as well as preserving in-person services for COVID-related or other urgent care needs. We're also worried about folks who might be left behind in what we're calling a digital divide. So thinking about older veterans or veterans in rural locations that don't have broadband access could be vulnerable to negative impacts from the switch from in-person care to virtual care. In particular, we're wondering about who those patients were who did not go from in-person to virtual care visits. So we followed about uh, 5.4 million veterans um, for their phone and video-based care utilization during that same time period up to um, about six months into uh, 2020. And we predicted whether or not they would be using virtual video care, adjusting for patient demographics, some social determinants of health, comorbidities, and then also their history of VA um, health care use. Uh, so in this figure, I'm presenting adjusted risk ratios and their 95% conference intervals for virtual care use. So that's phone or video. Um, we can see that older age was only slightly associated with virtual care use. We also see veterans with low income and high disability, um, which was defined by the VA Enrollment Priority Group, which is a priority-based system which categorizes patients um, into groups based off of their service-related disability and um, income and recent military history. Um, those veterans were more likely to use virtual care. In addition, those veterans um, with higher numbers of chronic conditions were more likely to use virtual care. When we look at just video care, we actually see some gaps. In particular, we noticed that older veterans who were aged 45 to 65 years were substantially less likely to use video care compared to veterans who were 18 to 44 year old. Um, highly rural and rural dwelling veterans were also much less likely to use video-based care during the pandemic. Highly rural veterans were 17% less likely to use video care um, during the pandemic period compared to urban veterans. And then we also saw that homeless veterans were about 11% less likely to use video care compared to non-homeless veterans during this time period. We did see that veterans with multiple chronic conditions or with mental health care conditions um, were more likely to use video care. Um, and then we also saw that females were about 30% more likely to use video care um, than male veterans. Results not shown included pretty negligible effects by race and ethnicity, um, which we were kind of pleased to see, um, as well as negligible differences uh, when you stratify by urban and rural um, status. 
So to recap, um, we saw that COVID-19 has really shaped how VA provides healthcare. Um, by June 2020, about 60% of VA uh, care was provided virtually. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was only about 14%. We found that older veterans and veterans with higher levels of need were more likely to use virtual care. And at the same time, older veterans and highly rural veterans, as well as homeless veterans, were less likely to use only video-based care. Um, so we're working on expanding this analysis past the first six months of 2020, and we're seeing some more results. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I wanted to also uh, acknowledge that this was a very large team effort um, with uh, Joe Jacobs, Maria Yefimova, um, Liberty Green, Leon Hayworth, and Donna Zulman. And it was uh, supported by both VA grants um, as well as uh, what's called the PHS Spectrum Grant. Um, and just thank you to all of the folks that were involved in this, including James, Cindy, Camilla, and the VA of Office of Connected Care for their help in supporting this evaluation. So um, if you'd like to hear more about this, I'll take uh, any questions at this time, and I'll be here during the discussion as well. Thank you, Jackie. Next, we have Rita, who will be sharing um, her extensive teaching experience uh, in methods and sharing some opportunities that are available for uh, data science. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with all of you. So great to see you and uh, hope you all are doing well. Uh, what we've already heard two amazing speakers. Um, so I hope you will humor me, maybe not as inspiring as the ones we've already heard. Um, so what I hope to share with you in the next few minutes are my musings and reflections as an ep epidemiologist, as a teacher and a mentor. Um, and as Lily said, you know, the whole goal is to see where there are opportunities for maximizing the potential of data science. Lily has already given you a little bit of my context, but in order to make sense of my musings, uh, let me just walk you through very briefly of my background. So I started my career in India as a physical therapist, and I somehow knew I always wanted to do research. Um, so I embarked my journey to the West, um, and after working for three years in the clinical space, I came to Massachusetts, and in fact, where Anike is right now, so I, I came to do my advanced master's in physical therapy at Mass General, and I worked there as a clinician in the inpatient outpatient space uh, for about six years. And it was there I realized, wow, I really enjoy research methods and statistics. And none of my colleagues enjoyed it. And I thought, wow, as clinicians, this is so, uh, so important and relevant. Um, so that kind of became my passion, that I was going to learn more because in order to teach and mentor, I needed to know these methods. Uh, so I got my master's in biostatistics and then culminated my journey here at Stanford, where I did my epidemiology degree. Um, and they never left. Uh, so my area of research was actually neuroepi. I was also a neuroclinical specialist. And so I studied genetic and non-genetic risk factors in Parkinson's disease and ALS. Um, but what I get most joy from is teaching and mentoring. And so I've done, a, I've done projects right from neonates to Alzheimer's disease and geriatrics. But I've done those vicariously for the most part through, through my students and, and mentees. So what I'd rather like to share uh, today are some reflections on what I have seen uh, as possible limitations, obstacles, and lots of potential and opportunities for people to learn from each other. Um, and I also have seen how we have moved so far away from you know, doing these studies where we enrolled 200, 300 patients to be able to leveraging big data now and combining different types of information, faster computers, amazing statistical advances. All of this has changed the landscape, but we should be mindful of where we come from and where our opportunities to learn. So what is data science, right? So I think we would all agree it's it's sort of the science of extracting patterns from data, whether these are structured or unstructured. And it kind of reminds me of the parable of the blindfolded men touching different parts of the elephant and each one brings their own perspective, right? Someone just thinks it's a trunk, someone thinks it's a rope, depending on what they're, they're looking at. 
So this is where, where's the analogy to data science? We all are going to, you've already seen people, the two speakers we've heard from come from very different backgrounds. And so at the core, data science is interdisciplinary, which means that we have to be mindful that we're coming with our own perspectives and there are many other perspectives out there and we should be wise and humble about that. Um, so broadly speaking, I feel data science, you know, traditionally can be thought of as having these two main components. There's a statistical component and then there's the computer science or the computational component. And I think at least most of us who are here would agree that then the research methods, and I want this to be a catch-all term. I'm an epidemiologist, of course, I, you know, for me, FE is important, but as we heard in some of the, uh, the other talks as we were starting this session, uh, the importance of behavioral science, right? So we hear from Dr. Halpern Felcher about the role psychologists plays. And so you can pretty much swap out epi for psychology, sociology, anthropology, doesn't matter. Some content area expertise. And what's interesting is that in the health space where we leverage clinical data, these boundaries are very blurred. So I, might, I find myself as an epidemiologist sitting in among now data scientists, right? Uh, and so I can't assume that I know that, you know, all other disciplines. So let me share with you sort of what I have seen, um, sort of the common, um, you know, barriers um, and my urges for those of you, and I don't know what spaces people come from, but to think twice about where, what you bring to the table and where you can learn from other disciplines. So right, let me quickly share what I have learned from the other, as, the other areas of, of data science. Computer science, computation has taught me the importance of logic and algorithms, verification and debugging. As we all know, right, we have all gotten our hands dirty with data, uh, especially in your earlier stages of your career. We spend so much time importing the data, tidying it, wow, bulk of the time goes there. And then transforming, visualizing, creating models, and then communicating this information. As we try to get and combine databases, some leveraging clinical information, maybe imaging, maybe environmental exposures, census data about your socioeconomic demographics, and so on, as we combine all of this to create and prepare our data set that we're gonna run our analysis on, we write code, right? So we have our do loops, we have our arrays. Now, hey, I'm not a computer scientist, so I have to be very careful that I learn best practices about logic. Is, the, is my do loop making sense? Do I have systems in place? And I notice over and over in the trainings when we teach our data management class, you know, this is not sort of a normal habit or a practice, but something that they need to develop. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the first point I wanted to underscore. What about statistics? This is again a very common a misunderstanding and misconception I see. Um, Oh, do you know, you know, who's going to analyze your data? Oh, I know R, I'm good to go. Uh, excuse me, learning R or SAS or STATA doesn't mean you know statistics. And so when I, you know, teach and, and train, you know, medical students and undergrads and, and fellows and junior faculty in our program, I tell them actually, we were, we're going to definitely teach you how to use R and SAS. Uh, but think of these as surgical instruments, right? Just because you, know, you are holding the instrument doesn't make you a surgeon. Same way, right? Just knowing how to code doesn't mean you know statistics. Um, and now um, I think it lulls us into believing, oh, I know I have missing data. Um, let's see, I'll just use multiple imputations. It's become so trivial to run the package in R and just run it. But it makes us lazy. First of all, we trust the machine and, and, the, and the software program to do the right thing. Have you guys, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, there's documentation that's about 50 pages long for all of these procedures and the different software programs. How many of us spend the time going through the documentation where all the caveats, the model assumptions, the limitations are listed? So this is where I find I myself, I'm including myself in this group, um, 
we get lazy. We just trust the system and know it's going to work. And I can tell you over and over, even just now in the spring quarter analytic class that I'm teaching, where students are using different software programs, same data set, and we get different results. Well, why? It's not the software that's doing anything wrong. We're just not really using the right assumptions or similar assumptions. So talk about the reproducibility crisis. And these are just small things that just propagate themselves. So lesson number two, don't think that just coding mean statistics. Okay, and then finally, let me talk about something that I'm trained in, right? Methods matter. Again, a misconception. Oh, big data, large data, thousands of observations. So what if I have 20% missing? I still have enough statistical power to come up with a precise estimate. Yes, but well, what good is a precise estimate if you haven't hit the bullseye, which means you're not getting accurate or unbiased findings. And so as a methodologist, yes, precision is important, but we care deeply about bias because it's so easy. And I think we heard this in one of the previous talks, um, the world, um, whatever summary, where people were saying existing data folks is collected not for research purposes. So it's very messy. It, it's, there's missingness. There is misclassification in the way we are measuring these uh, variables. There's missing confounding information. All of these introduce bias. And so again, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I repeat myself when I train, when I review proposals from students and, and trainees and, and I'll say, who's in your population? Well, I don't know, I'm just leveraging what's there. Yeah, well, if your data set has only yellow and reds and you're trying to you know, generalize these to the rest of the population, good luck doing that. You have no idea. You're lucky if it's only an external validity problem or a generalizability problem, but you could also have an internal validity problem. So what you're seeing makes no sense at all. And then finally, I think, you know, we, you know, as methodologists understand, and I think most people in this group probably understand, correlation doesn't mean causation. So in this cartoon here, right, just because sales are going up as people have shaved heads doesn't mean that everybody take a razor and shave your head, right? Correlation does not mean causation. And so causal inference methods are important. And why is that important? A lot of these machine learning AI algorithms are awesome for prediction. Prediction is great. It's exciting. Wouldn't it be awesome if I could predict someone's risk of cancer or cor cor coronary heart disease? We already have models that do that, and we can do better leveraging genomic and all kinds of proteomic and all of that information. But what good is prediction if I don't know what to do with that information? So causation is important because you need to know the cause so you can then come up with interventions or you know, uh, prevention strategies in, in the space of interest. Um, so all of this matters. So what is the punchline? You know, what is my takeaway message? We all speak different languages based on our backgrounds. Imagine being in a country where you didn't speak the language of the people who live there or you, you know, are living with. That would be very frustrating and inefficient. So, Let's take, let's try to learn about the other disciplines, the language they speak, the vocabulary, because ultimately we're going to collaborate and this will help us understand. Now, let me be clear. I'm not trying to say, let us be jack of all trades and master of none. That is not what my message is. But my message is to be humble, to understand what our perspective and our background is and where there are opportunities to leverage. So in closing, where do I feel the excitement for the young ones who are the future of data science, right? How do we maximize this potential? Look at the big picture, right? Step back, understand what your perspective is, learn from each other and collaborate. Because guess what? Our end goal is the same. We want to leverage big data and you know, all of this information to improve health outcomes, not just of our patients, but also of the communities around us, locally, nationally, globally. So let's do this in a meaningful way where we learn and collaborate with each other and bring something to the table. So thank you so much for listening.
And sorry, I know it's it's not something that is new, but I just thought, you know, I would share this. Thank you, Rita, for your insights on uh, research methods. Next, we have Bonnie who will be talking about tobacco and her e-cigarette projects. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm pulling up my slides now. Here we go. Well, thank you, and I'm so happy to be here and be invited to this really wonderful and important event that you're holding today. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit different style of, of presentation or, or focus, and I'm going to talk to you about translating science into policies and prevention. A lot, we a lot we work on. And I always like to thank our funders, and in particular, I need an updated picture of my lab, which I don't have with me, but my lab, because as others are saying, this takes a village to be able to do this kind of research. So my focus and my, my research for about 25 years is really focused on adolescent and young adult health risk behaviors. So why is it that teens make decisions and young adults make decisions to engage in risk behaviors, also health promoting behaviors around careers in science and medicine and so on. But for the past you know, 20 years, but particularly the past few years, I've really been focusing on adolescent young adult use of tobacco products and within the tobacco products, really been focusing in on electronic cigarettes, or you may know them as vaping products. And along this line, what my research really focuses on is what we would call T3 and T4 translational research. So bringing the research that we do, like I said, not, not just to, well, in my case, not to pharmace pharmaceuticals or to drug discoveries or to the bench side per se or the bedside, but really into community and prevention efforts. So a lot of what we've been looking at in my lab is the new tobacco products that have been on the market, particularly these e-cigarettes or vaping, and the Food and Drug Administration, who has the authority to regulate these products, put out various calls for research to help inform regulation and prevention. And there are major gaps in our understanding of these e-cigarettes, and there are so many changing products. So the FDA says, you know, I don't want to just understand <clears throat> the role of e-cigarettes. I want to know specifically, is it the red lever or the blue lever that's going to cause young people to use these products? Because if it's the blue lever, then I can regulate the blue lever as the FDA. Not that they're doing such a good job of regulation, but that's a different story. But that's what we do. And then try to translate that into policy and intervention. So my lab, we do this using California and US-based samples and using cross-sectional and longitudinal data. So we've had a couple of different data sets, three different data sets, where we've followed adolescents and young adults from say ninth grade all the way through high school and 12th grade through young adulthood serving them every couple of, about twice a year to really try to understand what, uh, what their role is and, and what, um, why they're using these products and what the products are, are that's enticing to them and appealing to them. And then our methods are surveys. So not necessarily the big data that some of you are talking about with millions, but we have certainly thousands and thousands of data points. If you can imagine, we have anywhere from 500 to a few thousand participants. We have about a 30 page survey. And so quite a bit of data points per participant. We also do mixed methods where we often interview or do focus groups with a subset of participants. That's where you can get the really deep, rich understanding of what's happening. So, and I'm not gonna go into all the specific data that we have, um, and certainly always happy to share papers, but it, we really focus on the rates and reasons why youth are using these cigarettes. And a couple of highlights of the findings. Um, one is we were able to look at data during COVID-19, particularly, and, and reasons why teens are using e-cigarettes during the pandemic and whether we're seeing changes in rates of use during the pandemic. And one of the important findings that we published on is that we're seeing a decrease in use of e-cigarettes during the pandemic. That's the great news. The not great news is those who are most addicted to e-cigarettes are finding it um, the most difficult to quit. So it really highlighted the need for cessation resources for these young people. We also looked at um, whether there's a relationship between using e-cigarettes and actually contracting COVID-19. And we found that there was, there was a very significant relationship there. And this led to policies that I'll talk about in a minute, 
but and, and it may not be lung disease it may be simply exposure you know as think about thinking about it from an epidemiological perspective you know you take your mask off while you're vaping or smoking you touch the doorknob you touch the vape you put it in your mouth you're sharing teens are sharing and so on so we actually were able to bring this research to a relationship with COVID. But we also looked at the role of, oops, excuse me, the role of flavors and, and uh, reasons for use, like it's easy to hide or the marketing access, misperceptions or perceptions, and then stress. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of these that we have found over the past few years in, and, why, and then we'll talk to you about why it's important for regulation. So when flavors, just for fun, think about the number of flavors that you think might be in an e-cigarette. How many total flavors, you can throw in the chat if you want. How many total flavors do you think there are of e-cigarette devices? And I'll show you some of those flavors now. And you're probably saying to yourself, chicken and waffles, when I give this talk in person, I, guess the, I always hear chicken and waffles. Yeah, chicken and waffles, tons of flavors. All right, ready for the punchline? There are over 15,000 e-cigarette flavors that are on the market. And you know, when you talk to the e-cigarette companies, they'll say, and this has been happening for years, oh, we, don't, we need these flavors because adults are using e-cigarettes instead of cigarettes. Well, no, that's not true, first of all. But even if they were, even if adults needed flavors to help them quit cigarettes, and that's a whole other conversation we can have during the Q&A, whether it's even effective. But for kids who are initiating with the, these products, they don't need things like sugar booger and honey doo doo and banana butt. That's not attracting adults. Those are youth flavors. And so one of the big things that our lab's really been able to do, and others have shown this too, is to go to the Food and Drug Administration, go to cities, go to states, and say, look, the fact that teens are initiating with these products and they're initiating because of the flavors tells us that we need to get rid of these flavors. And actually, I was involved in Senate Bill 793, a California bill to ban the flavors of of not only vapes, but all tobacco products in the state of California, which passed on my birthday. I always joke, it's second, second best birthday present I ever had. First was my husband taking me to see Bruce Springsteen. But anyway, so we've got, you know, thousands of flavors and we don't need these and we need to get rid of these flavors. The other piece is what well, we could say hidden in plain sight. You know, the fact that you can see these vaping products here and parents tell us, I, I didn't know my kids were using these products because I couldn't find them. I couldn't see them. And teens telling us in our research that we published that the reason why they use these products in addition to the flavors is because they can hide them from their families. So we've gone to the FDA and published papers saying we need to make these products bigger. We need to make them more obvious because there's no reason why we could, should have these little USB looking products that can fit in the palm of your hand. We've got marketing, come on. These flavors and these products look like juice boxes. This again is not attracting adults. These are attracting our kids. So we've talked about that with the FDA. And then access, oh, the legal age, if you don't know, to use tobacco and marijuana in, the, in, in California is 21. Across the country, the tobacco um, use age is 21 as well. So when you have things like this, where teens tell us, oh, I can easily walk into vape shops, publish a paper showing that teens are not being carded, they're not being asked for their IDs when they are, they're basically just being asked to show an ID. Come on, you know how easy it is to fake an ID. You know how easy it is to just put in a fake birthday. So again, when we were able to show this and say, look, when a science says student discounts, the majority of students are under 21, these are attracting our young people. Those data were able to be used to go to the FDA or states and say, we've got a real problem here. And then finally, perceptions. Teens just don't get these products. They don't understand how risky they are. They don't understand how much nicotine is in there because if you look at the packages, the packages say 5%. 5%, what does that mean? 5% of nicotine, which translates into more than a pack of cigarettes and a little e cigarette pod. Teens don't understand that. So we've been able to take the data on teens' misperceptions and go to the FDA and say, they don't understand, we need to regulate and change the product packaging. And why is it that we allow so much nicotine in these products? 
So this is to say, you know, we've really been able to translate the findings to advocacy. Just a couple of examples. This is Senate Bill 38, which was before Senate Bill 793, um, the original bill. And we're able to go to Congress or to, to the Senate in California and be able to present our results and be able to say why we need a ban. And not only that, doing it with young people, because forget our voices as adults, if we can get young people at the table, that's the most important. Testifying in Rhode Island, and the reason why I say this is the people to the right and left of me are from the tobacco industry. So when you're translating your research into policies, you've got to make sure, and this comes to what Rita was saying, that your findings are strong. And Rita knows firsthand that we had some issues with, with some of our data. They, everything was fine. It was not us. It was the tobacco industry. But they came after us because of one of our findings and tried to attack us. And it's so incredibly important, as Rita was saying, that you have re reproducibility and that you can really be able to talk strongly. Because when you've got something like big tobacco or big marijuana or big pharma or anybody against you, trying to, to poke holes in what you have, you have to be really strong. And then finally, um, testifying in Congress even on some of these things. And then just to end with toolkits. So we've been also fortunate to translate the research that we and others have done across the country into three, we just launched our third, three different prevention toolkits. So our tobacco prevention toolkit and our cannabis prevention toolkit are evidence-based uh, toolkits and curriculums for schools to use based on the science, but really pared down into tangible, bite-sized, understanding, understandable lessons that can be used in schools. And then VISIT is our brand new toolkit, just launched actually last week, for healthcare providers to help young people stop using their products. So really our toolkits and our science goes with the secular changes. We were originally going to be a three-ring binder. The science said go online. We were going to be comprehensive. And then people said, no, no, don't be comprehensive. Just fill in the gaps. We filled in the gaps. And then people said, we want comprehensive. Uh, we were originally just for educators, but everybody was using our materials so much that we expanded it to cessation and to healthcare providers. We had a pivot with Evali, uh, e-cigarette vaping associated lung illness with COVID and things like that. So part of the science is also being able to be translational, but also in the moment when you've got secular changes. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That was really insightful. I had no idea there were 15,000 different flavors for e-cigarettes. Um, with that said, thank you, Anaki, Jackie, Rita, and Bonnie for sharing your interesting projects, leveraging clinical data in many different ways. Um, and your reflections and experiences working with data science. We will now transition to the panel discussion. Um, I have a set of questions I'll be asking the uh, panelists and speakers, but if you do have any questions, there is room for you to um, ask those as well. So feel free to type them into the chat or unmute and we will get to your questions. So I guess to begin off is we've heard about all these different projects and in Rita's keep uh, case teaching different research methods as well as uh, Jackie's um, big data scientist training enhancement program. How did you actually learn to do data science? You don't have to answer uh, each of the questions, but feel free to chime in. <laughs> I can jump in. Um, for, for me, it was honestly, um, getting involved with other faculty members and just being willing to ask a question and then follow it down whatever the rabbit hole was. Um, so just getting involved. I think I got started with data analysis as like an undergraduate, just like hand entering surveys. And then I had a question and they like let me run with it. I really received very little formal training in how to do data analysis beyond like the biostats or epi courses. Yeah, I can add on to that. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree in math um, and had zero experience with data science during that degree, but I was I had this quantitative background and I wanted to really apply it to, to real world problems. Um, and so I kind of sought out a graduate degree where I could learn more about data science and by taking classes or um, like Jacqueline was saying, working with different professors and really, uh, yeah, just trying projects and learning there. Think was the best way 
for me to get into data science. And I have to say, um, for those of you who are listening, who are you know, tenure professors or full professors who have been doing this a long time, and also for the postdocs, I'll be honest, as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, I learn from my students. Um, you know, I, I learn from others. I was trained in a time, you know, where, and, and as a behavioral scientist, my, you know, we didn't necessarily use huge data sets. We used, when I was trained, it was 100 people would be considered good, and we were doing correlations. And so, you know, to make the kinds of models and statements that I do, you know, I try to keep up with it. I understand data science theoretically, but for me, you know, it's, it's relying on statisticians, it's relying on postdocs, it's relying on a team to really work on the, the big data or the data that we use. And I'm saying that not to say Bonnie doesn't know her data. I, I certainly understand it from a conceptual uh, perspective and do some of the analyses, but my point here is it does take a village, it does take a team, and that if, depending on the kind of science you're going to be doing, if you do more translational, more clinical, which was the theme of this talk, then you know, don't be afraid for everybody on this if you're not the one who's going to plug those numbers or chug. But as Rita was saying and the others are saying, it's also stepping back. And you know, I often do this, the sniff test. Does, does it make sense? You know, I get students who come to me and say, I've got a correlation. It's great. Okay, but you're telling me 13% versus 13.5% is significantly different when you've got 2 million people. That's not meaningful. That's not clinically meaningful. That's not policy meaningful. So let's step back and look at what's important. So, you know, I think the data science are hugely, hugely important, but there's a big picture that everybody has to take a look at as well. I'll just add one piece. And by the way, I'm no, by no means an expert, right? There's so many advances. And in fact, teaching keeps me very humble. And I'm a perpetual, I'm a lifelong learner and student. So I keep learning. And as Bonnie said, it's when students have different projects they're working on, it stretches me because I need to then go in and learn sort of for different projects, what the needs are. I did want to underscore though, from a uh, what I've noticed is that a lot of the PhD programs and both Anike and Jackie come from, you know, PhD training. So that's where there's less of a concern because I think most curriculums are changing and making sure our students are taking programming classes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how other programs are doing. So for example, I rarely see a student from informatics in my methods class. And I feel like there should be a cross-pollination. If we are asking and understanding our students should be taking a computer science programming class. And of course, statistics is integrated with, with EPI. So there's a lot of stats that goes on. I, I feel the reverse should be happening as well. Where I, where I think I hope to see more movement is at the master's level, because this is where we're not seeing as much. And I feel that's where a lot of the dangers are <laughs> because people just think, oh, let me take one class here, one class, and then I, I, and I know it. And I think that is, that is not the case. Um, so I, I just feel excited that I think as long as people understand that they're not gonna know everything and continue to be curious, we're, we're good. Thank you for the great advice. And I think maybe potentially um, some changes are needed in some curriculums to maybe um, help students learn about different kind of research methods, including those that relate to data science. So the next question I have for you is, with the Open Science Initiative, there is a greater push to openly share and reuse data sets. This is evident in our current pandemic, where some research teams and institutions have made their COVID-19 data widely available to help with applications in epidemiology, drug discovery, therapeutics, and so forth. So do you see the shift happening in your field? Are there any worries or pushbacks uh, to open data for the kind of data your field works with? So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think it's becoming more common practice. Again, I don't have a specific field, so I'm not going to talk specific, specifically in my domain. But often when you go to publish your work, the, the journal is going to ask you, are you willing to share data? And I think it's being encouraged more and more. Of course, you have to make sure it's anonymized and all of that. But I would love to hear what, what other folks, and I know the VA data is like 
tightly guarded, <laughs> but uh, you know, you can ask for permissions to to uh, be able to use it. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so VA data is available. You just have to put in IRB, and you have to get all these data, you know, access agreements, and you have to get credentialed. So it's quite a big wall um, for entry to using VA data. Um, but once you're in then it becomes much easier to continue doing other, other studies with VA data. And I, I think getting at the question um, that Lily asked, one of my concerns with open and sharing data is I, I, I would love it. I would love if we could you know, look at data more um, clean, clearly when we're looking at published studies. But in my mind, I think that the data that's shared on those you know, preprint servers or published servers are very different from the data that was originally collected. And I wonder if people are interested in looking at a you know, total open access data understanding everything. There's a lot of cleaning and manipulation that happens before you get to your analytic data set. And if we're trying to capture errors and trying to make things very reproducible, maybe that clean analytic de-identified data set isn't actually what you wanna be sharing with people. And so I go back and forth between like what you should make available to people because you've got access to that data set, you have some specialized knowledge for understanding that population that other people might not. And so it's this balance of like, you need to be able to share, but you also need to be able to protect the data such that it's interpreted in the right way. And where that falls with sharing data widely, I, I flip back and forth on a day-to-day -day basis. Jackie, I think that's a really great point. And also, um, you know, sometimes not only the data cleaning, but sometimes you're going to use a different baseline. You're going to use people who, you, 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 for me, I may use people who are using a tobacco product versus not, or I may use the whole sample, or I may use whatever. And, and in, in, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, love replication, reproducibility, all that. That's super important. But you also have to look at what you're using it for. And in my world, because I do so much policy work, um, I have had the industry folks ask me for my data and I will say, no, you know, you're, you're not going to have my data. I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, so what I've done, like what we're just saying in the open access journals, when I publish there is I will say, you know, people can come on an individual basis with a proposal to me and that, I, and people don't, once you have that, because the people who typically want to use my data are those who are not necessarily, not necessarily going to do it for any good. I mean, I've had postdocs and, and student people want to collaborate. That's different, but be otherwise. So I think we have to be careful and you also have to be careful if, if you've got identified data like we do. And even though we can de-identify it, if you've got longitudinal data, people can work backwards to figure it out. And again, you have to be careful. So I think the concept of sharing data is hugely important, but I think we have to watch as Jackie was saying, and, and you know, some of the concerns, watch those caveats very, very carefully. And I think people are being asked, so a lot of researchers are posting their code, the whole code documented and everything on GitHub and things like that. So I think uh, it doesn't address the concerns and great points that have been brought up, but at least maybe from a re replication of even your statistical modeling part, forget the data cleaning, perhaps, you know, if we can at least make that part available, so at least someone can go through our code and make sure we didn't like make a huge mistake, uh, I feel would also be a contribution, um, you know, to reducing this, this issue we're finding with, with reproducibility. Closely related to that, are there any existing guidelines or uh, like data management policies or a sort of um, guide researchers on how to actually manage their data, clean up their data, and potentially share their data for reuse purposes? Or is this more of a general practice within the field and it could vary across disciplines? There's like blog posts and like people's like presenting their way that they manage their data. Um, I've seen like a few of them hosted by um, like prominent users of like R, SATA or SAS being like, this is how I organize a project. And like, here's a good template as well as seeing people um, share their code and their formatting on like GitHub, for example, but I couldn't say if there's like a, like a standard or anything along those lines. I'm curious if anybody else has come across that. You no, know, it's more that some people will publish ahead of time or, or 
post, we did this with the data set we're working on with the quantitative science unit, um, the, the, the plan of analyses, we did that ahead of time. So that way it's clear that we weren't data fishing um, or like we have a, a couple of randomized control trials running now. And we had, to, of course, you know, say what that's going to look like. But short of that, no. And, um, and I like the idea, you know, maybe publishing the code in the supplemental is the way that we should be doing it. So at least people can see it. We, we had a paper recently we went back and forth on with, with a couple of postdocs. And each postdoc was coding it differently, and but speaking sort of different language and how they were doing it. They, they, and then so we, we went back and disaggregated the code to make sure that we felt comfortable and we were fine. It didn't make a big difference, but we wanted to make sure that we had the right co covariate in there. Um, so, you know, you could argue that putting in the code would be a smart idea. Yeah, and I think it goes back to Rita's point that the field is so interdisciplinary that I don't know of any one overarching organization or body that says, okay, these are the standards that we want for data, organization, transparency, um, but I think it would be nice to have. <laughs> for sure. Um, so I do have one question for Anaki and Jacqueline from chat uh, from Colleen. She asks, I'm curious about your work with others on your team, specifically how collaborative are your data processes or is there a dedicated data scientist on your teams? Okay, I can start. Um, and so our process was very collaborative and we we're also collaborating, I forgot to mention with the California Department of Public Health. Um, and so we were working directly with the uh, data scientists on their team. Um, but for our model, um, I wouldn't say we had a specified person who was the data scientist and other people were not doing data science, um, but we definitely had processes um, that we established ahead of time of how we were organizing our data how we were cleaning it um, and how we worked on it together um, and different roles that we established with the, such a big team. Um, and we also uh, broke it up by different projects based on location. So I was working on the California project, but there are others working on um, looking at Mexico City um, or at the national level in Mexico. So that's kind of how we organized it. in the VA in the last few years. I've worked on a number of different projects with kind of like different formats. Um, in one of them, um, I took the data from the electronic health record system, exported it in SQL, put it into Stata, did everything, and then did the whole batch. And that was a very, very time intensive process because I speak SQL like a kindergartner. Um, and so that was like very stressful for me. In other projects that I've been involved with, like the one that I just um, presented looking at the virtual care, that we did have um, like a data manager and we had two, two people, Liberty and James, um, who are amazing and have a very, very great fundamental knowledge of how the VA data is structured and where best to pull things from because with electronic health records, data can pop up in multiple places and be conflicting. So they had a really high level expertise. And so they built kind of a raw chunk of a cohort for me, which then I manipulated um, in, in, in Stata and R um, to kind of come up with the results as you kind of see in a paper. So they did a lot of the background stuff. So I've worked both ways. Um, it's very collaborative. It just depends on one, the scope of the data, how complicated is it, what you're pulling, if it's been pulled before, and where folks kind of fit in. I'm working on a few projects now, which is a little foreign to me, where I'm not doing the day analysis and I'm like mentoring other students as they do the day analysis with the data set I'm familiar with. And it's completely backwards and very foreign to me. And I'm trying to learn this new skill set. And so all the projects I work on kind of change based off of funding and um, availability of the data. Yeah, and I do, Jacqueline made me think of this. Yeah, we did have one data analyst who was kind of in charge of cleaning the data and pulling it. And then we had other people analyzing it in different ways. So I didn't want to clarify that. Leah Prince is doing that. She's great. Data managers are amazing. So, so good. There's so much time spent in just curating data, not even analyzing or cleaning it. Um, right. That can be so tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, so this next question is going to take a different, slightly different turn, but um, in the fields of medicine, data science, there are wide gender disparities in leadership, pay, and other facets. This is especially evident in some specialties where women are very underrepresented. Um, have you encountered any misconceptions people have about women working with data science and medicine? Um, what would be one piece of advice you would give to people working in data science or anybody um, participating in today's call um, to support women in the field? I've seen kind of a split by gender from like how you refer to a data scientist. I've seen more female scientists be in more of the epi roles and the analytic roles. And then I've seen more males be in like the SQL coding, what you would see for like the high paying like Silicon Valley coding jobs. Like they're the ones who speak Python and the women are the ones that do like the statistics and the epidemiology and it's kind of split along those lines. Um, which I think is kind of just a misconception on how data science is advertised and also that no one really knows what data scientists do because it's such a large field. So I would encourage folks to pursue whatever portion of that band of data scientists, whether you want to start at coding with Python or SQL or, you know, some of these more foreign, um, non-GUI click and point statistics, or if you want to come over and kind of the public health epidemiology, sociology world, wherever you want to be, there, there really shouldn't be any boundaries for that, but there does seem to be kind of a preconception about who a coder is versus who an ML analyst is. I, I haven't um, experienced the gender issue as much, you know, in this area. And certainly not necessarily recently, but I will say, but I run a lot of math and science programs or uh, health ed or programs for high school students going into science. And, you know, there you, you know, I work a lot with the students of biases and not only women, but racial ethnic bias, biases and, you know, just trying to make sure that we have, you know, like this panel is fabulous. There's many people who look like them would look like to be able to give the encouragement, I think is really important. Now, I grew up in a time, I'm older than, than some of you, uh, the postdocs, I grew up in a time where going into math and science, particularly the basic sciences for women uh, was not popular. And I remember being told in middle school, well, you, you can't answer that, you're a woman when I was in advanced math and or basically not even calling on me and calling on the, the guys in the, in the classroom. And it certainly hurt my confidence then in, in my abilities. So I think you know, we just need to keep strong, keep getting the word out. And you know, whatever it is that the field is that people are choosing, know that that's the right field because that's what they wanted to choose, not because that's what they thought they should choose. Yeah, at least in, um, you know, in medicine, there is a very high representation of women. And, and so at, le at least in our program, and again, we're not training data scientists, right? We're, we're training, you know, clinical researchers and clinical epidemiologists, and then the classic epidemiologists. Uh, so data science is a piece, but it's not, the, you know, the whole thing. Um, so at least uh, we tend to see a lot of women um, come through our program. And um, in fact, it usually is 60, 70 percent are actually women seeking a master's degree in clinical FP after the MD training or medical students who are stepping out in, in their fourth year to do the master's program. So I think um, an EPI, as Jackie said, traditionally has drawn public health somehow seems to resonate a little more with, with women. <laughs> so um, I'm hoping that men would be inspired to, to do this as well. So uh, it's almost like there are fewer men, at least in that public health space. Uh, but, you know, it, it warms my heart. There are lots of women seeking uh, these opportunities. Yeah, I will echo that. I've definitely noticed more women in the healthcare space in data science rather than in the data science in general space. And so I think it's 
Uh, that's good to see, but I think there is a lot of work in the general data science space to not have more women involved in all types of, whether it's more theoretical projects, like Jackie was saying, or more applied projects. It sounds like we made some advancements, but there is still a long way to go, um, both in medicine as well as uh, other interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary um, disciplines and domains beyond medicine. Before I ask my final question, um, is there anybody from the chat or the call that would like to ask a question to any of the panelists? Okay. You might be thinking of a question, but I'll go ahead and ask my final question. But if something does come up, please feel free to type it into the chat or unmute. Um, so the final question relates to the next generation of research. Um, science and technology scholars like Donna Haraway project an era of cyborgs, which is like a, a hybridization between machines and organisms. So maybe we will have like these chips in our arms or, or, or something of that sort. Um, so what areas of development in your field do you anticipate or imagine for the future? I think the big excitement is around, I think we heard this, right, like the watches and things that monitor your <laughs> physiologic measures and you're getting constant reading of your, you know, blood glucose levels and your heart rate and trying to predict, you know, the next arrhythmia or a heart attack. I mean, I think we're already seeing a lot of these these projects coming in but making sense of the data are going to be so almost i feel impossible uh to see this but i feel that that's where where we're at that cusp we're already seeing um all of that information come in and i would love to hear what what others think but that's where i think a lot of the healthcare space uh, is going with all of using technology and digital health and so on data sources. Um, so we have a lot of these kind of pools of information. We've got the healthcare records, we've got like biomonitoring data, we've got like work histories and other countries have been pretty successful at linking those things so you can get a, a more complete picture of, of populations, uh, countries like the Scandinavian countries. And I'd like to see that happen in the US as well, but we're very odd about our data privacy and liability associated with data. If you, you know, find something the workplace is doing, then that workplace is liable and they might get sued. So they don't want to share any information. So I think we've got all these different pools of information. It'd be great if we could start to make more solid connections in a way that is secure and protects, you know, the PHI and the identifiability of participants. Um, so that you can look at, okay, this worker in this factory who has this healthcare record and this biomonitoring data and get a complete picture of, you know, following a population through, through time. Yeah, I think there's just going to be an increase in more and more data that's available and more people who are excited to use it. And what I hope is that there's also an increase in the study of ethics around data science um, as different algorithms and data science is more um, is affecting people's lives and health and other ways. I really hope that um, that there's more of a consideration of how biases and algorithms can can affect um, what the outcome of these algorithms are and how that can affect people. And so that's my my wish. <laughs> Thank you for those insights and hopefully maybe we'll see some changes in the future related to those aspects. Um, looks like we don't have any more questions rolling in from the chat, uh, but on behalf of Amanda and Connie and I, we would really like to thank you for your participation and, and of course your time for speaking with us today. And we really appreciate the projects and the insights that you share, as well as the contributions you've made within your disciplines. Um, 
Hopefully this was fun for you to participate and weren't too much in the hot seat, but I thank you again for joining us uh, for the panel. And for those of you joining us uh, on the call, uh, we will take a short break, but uh, following the short break, we will uh, be doing some group discussions and we have a set of questions that we would like to engage and discuss with you. Um, so please stay for that as well. Thanks again, everyone.